Hello, everybody. John Moses. Uh, I wanted to welcome everybody today to our fireside chat regarding moral injury with our good friend Natalie, who uh, works at the VA and has done some significant work around this particular um, this particular type of event and what it's kind of meant. And has I assume, like all of us, seen over the last year, a lot of people go through this particular um, you know this particular mental state where with 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 moral injury. So. Um, with that, uh, I'm John Moses. I'm part of uh, the Afghan EVAC overall and a case manager, but uh, I do a lot of work with resilience uh, to try to help other case managers like me that have dealt with some of these issues uh, like moral injury. So with that, Natalie, if you want to give a little bit of your background and kind of just an overview of what you felt uh, would be important for people to know about moral injury. Sure. Uh, so my name is Natalie Pickering and I'm a licensed psychologist. Uh, I'm also a board certified coach and my my first role in the VA was working in the PTSD or post traumatic stress disorder clinic. So working with veterans um, across war eras. Um, and I, I started realizing that, you know, even when we were knocking out PTSD symptoms like nightmares and avoidance and depressive symptoms, the, the hyper startle kinds of things, you know, we were really doing some great work. There were these, you know, ongoing symptoms like shame, guilt. And so honestly, I I came to learn about moral injury. My veterans taught me uh, what moral injury is and how to support them. Um, my role has shifted. Uh, I'm now an organizational development psychologist. And so I'm, I'm working more in the leadership space, working with teams. Um, but you know, we can use the concept of moral injury, especially in the pandemic. So lots of lots of people in support roles felt, you know, betrayal um, yep. by not being able to be protected or, you know, like in healthcare, not having their protective equipment. Um, leaders or people who are working for leaders, you know, when decisions are made that I don't agree with, there's this element of betrayal um, that people experience that that would really come under that same umbrella of moral injury. So again, I got my start working with veterans. Um, the term was was coined back in the 50s by Dr. Jonathan Shea, who was also working with veterans and had that same experience, right? Like we're knocking out these symptoms, but there's this existential, spiritual thing that we're not hitting. So his work really prompted, um, introduced the term moral injury. And maybe I should start with what, what that is. Uh, so, so everybody's on the same page, but basically, you know, we have our own moral ethic. So that, that may be, you know, influenced by our families. It may be influenced by our faith traditions, our, our spiritual beliefs. Um, and so then when soldiers, join the military, there's a very different moral ethic uh, in the military, um, which includes hurting, killing, et cetera, right? This is a whole different playbook, rule book. So I have my moral ethic. I'm now with this entity that has a different moral ethic. Now right. I do things or I don't do things. So a moral injury may be related to something that I've done um, that I feel horrible about, or it may be that I didn't intervene or I didn't do something. And I'm left with this conflict. How do I reconcile this action behavior, what I've seen yeah. with what's true to me? Um, and so there's just this really, um, painful yeah shame guilt those kinds of things um for people who are experiencing this yeah absolutely and i agree i think i think uh one of the things that i one of the th you mentioned a few things that you know that you you could be forced to do something or you know you could see something and i think there's another kind of you know for me and a lot of the case workers it was something that is so out of your control right yes and in this case i think for afghan evac as it relates to evac was for us was i had I had PTSD anyway, and then what I discovered with moral injury was a deep well of something, some other set of emotions, right? And when I saw the, when I saw everything failing, and this is again, this is a situation I think a lot of us were in. Mm -hmm. uh, all of us had made, not all, 
people had made promises. So, and um, as for me, and the moral failing was always, we weren't, you know, we weren't Russia. We weren't going to come in and kill people and then leave and just abandon everybody. And I had made promises. Yes. And my friends had made promises. And and I remember when, when um, the president left the country and all of the air just left the room because not only did my country fail them, but the country that I supported and, you know, we all supported and did all that work and bled for and, and died for um, failed them too. Right. So yes. did my work, did my work matter? Right. So I think those are really great points. And I think, um, yeah, I really feel like this really opened up a lot in people that uh, they weren't expecting. I did not understand moral injury until I was punched in the face with it. So, <laughs> yeah, well, and, you know, to your point, I think the narrative that so not unlike Vietnam and the narrative that uh, a good amount of the country had around our soldiers coming back you know, in for the Afghanistan situation, the narrative around that conflict for society and culture is adding a layer to our veterans, to our soldiers who have invested and sacrificed and compromised and now feel like, what was all that for, right? Now I'm carrying all this PTSD stuff or I'm carrying, you know, physical, you know, injury and I have these truly life changing right. effects on my life. And was that all in vain? That's a tough pill for anyone to swallow. Yeah, no, it really is. I talked about it the other day. I think you saw that they had the meeting with um, the Secretary of State Blinken. And one of the things that a lot of us were pushing was I need and, and you know, Kate from Resiliency did a good job of speaking to it. But case managers felt very unheard, too. That was the other thing is like, yeah we didn't have governmental support, right? We're all volunteers and we were just shouting at the government all the time and they weren't really yeah. there, right? Like, yeah. There was a long time and you brought it up, I just, um, Vietnam veterans is one of the things I talked about was where I suddenly have in the past year become very um, more empathetic or sympathetic. I don't know what the right word is, but I definitely understand how Vietnam veterans felt, like how they came yeah. out of there and, and that like, I have to do something. And then people like John McCain and John Kerry and all these other politicians that came out and said, I feel wounded by this and I'm just going to go fix it because it's mm -hmm. that's what soldiers and service members tend to do. So, um, which is, I think, a lot of the drive to action that you saw during, you know, that first couple of weeks in August where everybody just dropped everything and just went, <laughs> went for yes. broke. Actually, because I think my brain wasn't working. But <laughs> <laughs> well, I'll tell you, um, related to that, we so when I was in the PTSD clinic, I <clears throat> partnered with Chaplain Services and I said, we've got to address this <clears throat> in a new way. So we started a group, um, a moral injury group and built out, you know, different phases for healing. But one really cool thing was we included veterans from different wartime eras in the same group. Yeah. And there was some really just some healing conversations around understanding, you know, again, all, all of the conflicts have their own nuances and challenges and, you know, political spins and all of those kinds of things. But honestly, getting them in the same room, uh, giving them a chance to share in a safe way about those woundings and to realize, wow, that's exactly how I felt, you know, right. 20 plus years later um, was was really incredible. One thing we know in in addressing moral injury, I mean, there's there's multiple factors and, you know, what will support someone well, but one thing that we implemented was having so at the very end of the group we had like their loved ones friends and family other employees from the va all gather together and and take community responsibility right we asked you to do this right you yeah. you represented us our nation our freedoms and so we want to stand physically with you yeah. and take and hold and hear and own the impact that this has had on you. Um, because I think it's so isolating and and we just have got to do a better job in, in verbalizing and saying we, the community, the country, the culture, the society are responsible um, for all of these internal struggles um, that our veterans are carrying. 
Yeah, absolutely. I, you know, and for me, again, on the other side, you know, I experienced the other side of that, 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 that solitude and being alone and, and it was, it wasn't a good place. Right. And I definitely feel like there's been a lot of thought uh, from, and again, a lot of this is just me, kind of my experience, but about how Americans and how we treat our service members. Right. And I bet you could go back to ancient Rome and you would find a soldier that would have the same moral injury problem. Right. Yeah. All these PTSD, none of this stuff is new. Right. Humans yeah. have been humans for a long time. But I definitely remember looking back during evac and just feeling completely isolated because how do you talk to your mom or like your wife or somebody that hasn't been to Afghanistan or somebody that hasn't been saved by an Afghan interpreter, right? Like somebody somebody saved my life, right? And then I have mm -hmm. obligation now, right? Whether it's fair or not, right? Like he pulled me out of a bad spot. But how do you explain that kind of connection with somebody? And how do you explain the connection with Afghan people and how generous and kind and how open they were to becoming in a more Americanized society and it just all got taken away, you know, over that time. But yeah, you're right. Like the community as a whole, they all, you know, there's all this, I support veterans, we buy you coffee, you get free appetite right. and it's all very performative. Right. And for us, it's a very deep moral issue that doesn't necessarily get addressed at that kind of like light level. So yes. I love that you do that. I think that's a great, that's a great, that's a great um, opportunity for people. Yeah. And I think, too, you know, giving um, we also, you know, built experiential kinds of things. They did a really interesting project at Walter Reed where they would have veterans create literal masks um, because that's that's often how veterans that I worked with would describe it. Like, I feel like I'm. I'm presenting a different version of myself and I'm there's not a freedom to be who I am. And if people knew what I was really thinking, if people knew what I was really feeling, I don't think they'd want to share oxygen with me. I don't think they'd want to be in the same room with me, like let alone be my friend or be married to me or whatever. So, oh, yeah. you know, giving again, giving space to say and and you know, whether they're they're making masks and um, one thing that I did in my group, we used these like the the Chinese takeout boxes. Um, and so we had them like inside the box, you know, who what's really happening in there. And I'll never forget this. I had one of my veterans went over to the trash can and started pulling out trash and gluing it into the center of his takeout box um, yeah. because that's that's was his view of self and then the outside of the box right they would put here's what i'm presenting to people right i'm i'm strong i've got it together this isn't really bothering me all that stuff and then we did a ritual so to speak and everyone opens up their takeout box to say here's the real deal of how i feel about myself yeah and and again, for them to be able to speak into that with one another to say, wow, we were all sharing some of this, you know, junk going on in here. What do we want to do? Um, forgiveness, right, is a huge part of that. But I, we, we, we can't jump to forgiveness prematurely without honoring all of that emotion that got hijacked in the moment. Because when you all are in the middle of those situations, there's no time to do grief and acknowledge like the horror and the fear and all of that stuff. So on the tail end, the work is, okay, we've got to make space to get that emotion hooked back up with that memory so that it is not taking you to your knees like it was. Absolutely. And that's exactly what it was, right? So the two weeks of the vortex, the whole vortex of, um, of just everything happens, right? Like that's the thing. I did want to comment though. I did want to say one. The box is an interesting is an interesting story, right? Like being able to kind of put your who you really feel like you are because service members generally, and I don't want to just focus on veterans too, because definitely civilians, nurses. There are a lot of State Department employees that also felt more a ton of moral injury, right? Yes. I, I worked with USAID workers and refugee workers. All of those people have every right to feel moral injury too. I just happen to be a veteran, so that's kind of what we're talking about. Yeah. Um, but for veterans and for like service members, that whole box thing is your box better look good, right? Like all the time, right? You're not yeah. actually allowed to be, you train under high stress for years and years. I, I'm retired from the army. I was 23 years in the army, retired. Mm -hmm. And um, boy, I look good all the time. 
I was always yeah. sharp. I never, never had problems. I didn't, I mean, I yelled at people, but it was part of the job and the persona. But at the end of it all, you don't learn that you can actually just be a normal human being without being in, you know, like doing the army thing. So, yeah, I definitely, I, I, I actually really identify with that. There's a lot of things inside of me that I just don't really, um, this, I, this, people wouldn't understand, like, why? Why would mm -hmm. you bring that, right? And that's kind of the whole point of all the therapy and the PTSD treatment and yeah. injury, right? It's hard. And again, I, I'm glad you referenced, you know, opening up the aperture and, and the research in the last you know, well, especially since the pandemic, you know, healthcare providers have really latched on to this term again with the pandemic. And, you know, in the early, we didn't know what COVID-19 was, right. figuring out how to treat it. Um, I mean, we had healthcare personnel working around the clock, you know, having very limited you know, protective equipment for themselves, living apart from their children because they didn't want to, you know, they're worried about transmitting it to their families. And so the the piece of moral injury that really resonates with healthcare providers, um, you know, other support personnel is that like betrayal, you know, maybe feeling unappreciated, being asked to do things that I am not at all equipped to do. Um, feeling, you know, unappreciated. I, I supported many healthcare professionals who just, you know, they would be, you know, working those shifts and, and then trying to get groceries and people, you know, like not wearing their masks. And they were like, what, Take <laughs> what is happening? Well, and right. And that's the thing is, and I think that's the moral, there's a bunch of places I feel nurses could claim some pretty solid moral injury. But for me, you like, at, you know, one of my best friends is a nurse, and then I would get in arguments with people. I'm not wearing, and I'm like, just just wear the mask, like I like yeah. whatever it is. But like for them, it's like I'm putting my life on the line because we don't know what COVID is at this point, right? Like yes. those nurses don't know, um, and they're doing things that they, they they don't know how risky it really is for their family, right? My friend, the nurse, would come home and she would take all of her clothes off in the garage, put them directly in the washing machine, and go in her basement and never see her family for months. She yep. didn't. And can you imagine like going out and people are just giving nurses crap or like the government's like, ah, we have enough masks or you're selling them through a private market, right? Like, are you really supporting the people that are helping? And I, right. I think that's a really good, interesting way to look at it, right? Like, just, yeah, there was a bigger obligation to the, the in this case, in, to the medical community than we uh, we as a society provided, I think. Right. And I understand their I understand their moral injury or outrage or whatever, whatever emotion they have behind it. Yeah, exactly. And that, I think that illustrates, you know, the two components of, you know, what moral injury is. So there's this, you know, I did something or I didn't do something. And then there's this other piece of, you know, this was a chain of command issue, so to speak, or, you know, in whatever role your chain of command is in your own workplace, yep. even just generally, um, there are even some articles on Forbes around a leadership moral injury, right? And and the impact of toxic leadership and how that term is applicable in other industries too. Oh yeah, toxic leadership's a big one, right? Well, I mean, the thing, again, I was military. So for me to go, I have a civilian job, I have a civilian career. And one of the things I always struggled with, <laughs> struggled with was um, weak management because it was like, you have like moral obligations to your employees, right? And I know yeah. not everybody believes that in the corporate world. It's just not how, it's not the same as the military. But yeah, you're absolutely right. You could have somebody that's in charge of the hospital that doesn't take your request seriously. And, you know, people are getting hurt or your best friend gets sick and all of that adds up to being really wounded. And it's a deep, it's just a different, and the reason we actually separated this one out, you know, Kate and I, when we spoke about it was, um, it's so different than the PTSD. It was so, it was so debilitating. It was just like yes. this. It was like, I, I don't even like to use the word, but it was almost like I vomited grief. It was like, I yes. almost, I was just, all of the things that I believed about my country and what we were going to do for Afghans was completely wrong, right? It was right. all fake. And like, we ended up, especially the DOD people really ended up at the front line of that and deal, dealt with, I mean, we dealt with death and, and every possible bad thing you could think of. I've, you know, I've seen it now and I've seen it in film and we, you know, we did a, we did one of these on, um, you know, disturbing images because mm -hmm. after to try to show to humanize and all that, but all of this in moral injury though, for us stood out and moral injury to me was, uh, was really something important to speak about. 
But we are running up on 20 minutes, but I, it, it, this is your show. So I would like to uh, ask if you have any closing things, but then also, are there any resources, um, and we can provide these as part of when we release it to everybody, uh, and if there are any resources um, that people should be using or reaching out to, or just general advice for people that feel like they're kind of in that like bubble. Yeah, for sure. So I think it is important to note the overlap of moral injury with PTSD. You know, it's it's not super clean. You can no. even throw burnout into that. I know you all do a lot on resilience. Yeah. So there's, you know, it's kind of like a multi Venn diagram, so to speak, with some symptoms kind of, you know, hanging out um, in some of those. And of course, as a psychologist, we want to label all those things. Um, <laughs> you know what would be inside my 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 container? It'd be some crazy soup. It would be like just what I don't know what. There's yeah. No, there's no. Yeah. Denial. So I, I don't <laughs> I don't want this to, you know, it's so nuanced for each person, and you know, right. we're speaking generally, but. Um, there is, uh, I think it's with Bright Divinity School, a, a soul repair center. So Rita Brock um, has done a lot of work in this area. Um, there's also a handbook, and I'm happy to send a link to you, that has a really nice just overview of what it is. They've even, um, this was funded for VHA. Um, I think it's Pat Pernicano, who is a PTSD psychologist, put this together Um and it's just a nice, here are some ideas, but but I would say on the whole, the basics, right? Attending to your, you know, physically, um, attending to mental, emotional distress. And then the the key piece for moral injury is that community that I that I talked about before. So whether that's, you know, faith communities who are rallying around people struggling with this this there's a spiritual existential element by definition of moral injury that has to be attended to yeah i love that no i love that and i think part of my my whole shtick is that you know people um i i hit bottom right like with for a whole bunch of reasons and i had i kind of had to pop out of it and i had to do it i had to hit bottom to be willing to do the work and i hope other people if they see this don't have to (laughs) don't want to you know wallow around in the bottom of the pool yeah you know, for a while before they figure it out. So yeah, that's why we're recording this. We want to give people uh, opportunities to see that. And, um, but with that, I do want to say, I very, very much appreciate you taking the time to come out, Natalie. It's, um, it's really fun and supporting people like this has been, um, it's very meaningful to people like me. So caseworkers are kind of a different breed. Like a lot of us weren't leaders of organizations or anything. We're literally just the people doing the grind work. So, um, but all of those people, also have moral injury it's just you know yes. personally i appreciate it and as a resiliency group i appreciate it on behalf of everybody that's kind of gone through this stuff i i i love what you're doing i love that there's actually healing happening um in in what you're doing so i'm i'm thrilled to be able to support you in a small way awesome well i appreciate it natalie i'm gonna hit uh, stop record here i think